Merry Christmas, guys. How are we doing? I want to start by expressing some gratitude to you, uh, those of you who are attending online and those of you in the room. I just want to start by expressing some gratitude to all of you. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was teaching on uh, talking about money and giving, and, and I said that when you're generous, that people will thank God for you. They'll praise God for you when you're generous. And I had that experience over the weekend, and I'm continuing to have that experience for you because of your generosity. I have been given the great honor to handle the funeral of a 15-year-old girl today who spent her life disabled, and she passed away on Wednesday. And I'll be overseeing her funeral today at 2 o'clock. Through the weekend, I have met with the father for breakfast. I met with the mother and the stepfather uh, at their home. I spent some time at the funeral home last night with their family. And I was able to serve and be in this family's life. And I will serve them today. And this is a family that lives too far from here. They're not driving from where they live to this church. They're, they, they have nothing to give back to us. And we're serving them. And I wanted you to know that I was grateful for you. Because over the weekend, I have sensed God's spirit. I have sensed God moving and serving this family who suffered such a great loss. And I would not be able to serve them if it were not for this church supporting me. And supporting the ministry of this church. You were as much a part of serving this family over this weekend as I have been. So thank you. Thank you for supporting the ministry here, not just financially, although that's important, but thank you for supporting it with your time, your effort. Thank you for understanding that what God is doing here is bigger than just the physical place. And yes, there's great things happening here, children's ministry, student ministry, and all those things. But God's arm from this place is going out into the city in all types of ways and all over the world. And one of those ways was this weekend for me to serve people that you deployed me to serve. Thank you for that. Merry Christmas. I'm grateful for you. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump into uh, our next part of He Shall Be Called. Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for this body of believers. Thank you for this church. Thank you for their uh, support of what you're doing here and the, the, the work that, that you're doing here. I'm just grateful to you, Lord, that, that they get it. Um, I pray that you would bless us and use us in this community in ways that we cannot ask or imagine, that you would do more than we could ever dream possible, that you would do it through us, and that people might, might know that God loves them and God is for them, even in the midst of their suffering and misery and pain. We pray now, Lord, you open our hearts and our minds that we might hear from you, and understand what we need to know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we've been in this series one week. This is week two. He shall be called. And we started by looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 last weekend. You guys remember this? And that was this prophecy in the book of Isaiah, and this is what it says. It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so we have these four names that the prophet Isaiah gives uh, to the Messiah. Now, who knows what the prophet Isaiah fully understood about that, but the, but the prophet Isaiah, uh, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, okay, hundreds of years, I think like 800 years before the birth of Jesus, is announcing that God is going to send a Messiah, God is going to send a Savior, and these are the four things that we can call him. He can be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so last weekend, we talked extensively about how Jesus met the category of Wonderful Counselor, how he was indeed a Wonderful Counselor. And we looked at a story uh, in the, the Gospels where Jesus talked about surviving storms that come into your life. And we said that with Jesus as our Counselor, with him leading our lives, it will not protect us from the storms of life, but it will keep us safe while we are in the storms of life, that everyone faces storms. Everyone goes through very painful and terrible situations. 
But with Christ leading our lives, we said we can survive the storms. We can be safe in the storm. And that was last weekend. This weekend, we're going to talk about the title, Mighty God. So Jesus being Mighty God. So Isaiah claims that the coming Savior will be called Mighty God. And the question that we simply have to ask is this. Did Jesus ever claim to be Mighty God? Did he ever claim that? If Isaiah said that was going to be one of his titles, then this, so if you're new to, new to church or new to Christianity, this is a fundamental question because a lot of people like Jesus, they like his teachings, they like, uh, they like him, but this whole idea that Jesus is God is a struggle for many of you. And I know some of you are, even if you say you're a believer, that question is still there in you. Like, well, was this man a God? And so Isaiah said that he would be called mighty God and that his baby born would be God in flesh. Now, here's the thing. Did Jesus ever say he was God? Did he ever claim to be mighty God? That's the question. And the second question is this. If Jesus did indeed claim to be God, him being God, what does that offer us? What did he say that would do for us? Now, I, the text we're going to look at today is going to answer those, both those questions. The first question, claim to be God. And the second question, offer us. We're going to answer that for us. Grab your Bible and go there, but I'll set it up for you. John chapter 8, verse 48. If you have your uh, phone, you can go there too. I'd encourage you to look at it. Because um, what we're about to read is a, is a last section of a long conversation between Jesus and some Jewish people who believed in him. Now, this is an important detail. I don't fully understand it. Scholars debate it a lot because they don't fully understand it either. This conversation, this back and forth that Jesus is having with these Jewish people, they're believers in Jesus. And yet, whatever it is they believed about Jesus, it was not correct because the debate they have, the argument they have, is about this issue of Jesus being mighty God, Jesus being God. Like they obviously believe he's maybe a good teacher, or maybe he was the Messiah, maybe he was some type of prophet, but they did not believe that Jesus was the mighty God. And so these Jewish people who like Jesus, keep in mind, they like Jesus. They're, they're fans of Jesus. They're having this back and forth with Jesus. And they're arguing that, hey, we are the descendants of Abraham, and we're good with God. We already know we're good with God. And then Jesus says, you guys are not the children of Abraham because if you guys were the children of Abraham, you would have faith in me and you'd be free from sin. And then Jesus, Jesus goes on to say this to these guys. And it gets heated, man. It gets like, like you ever seen arguments get out of hand? Like this thing is getting out of hand fast, okay? This is what Jesus says to them. He says, you guys, you guys aren't children of Abraham. He says, you're children of the devil. And you're all a bunch of liars, and you, of course, you're liars because you're children of the father of lies and you don't belong to God. I mean, it's, it's ugly. It's just they're back. And what the argument's about is really who Jesus is. That's really at the crux of this. We're going to pick up their conversation starting right here. This is verse 48. And this is what the Jews, remember, they're fans of Jesus, but they, they can't believe he's, they, they, they're trying to figure out who he is. The Jews answered him, aren't we write in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed. I told you, escalated quickly, right? Like yours. And Samaritan was just like, you're not a pure Jew. You're not an actual Jew. You're an imposter. Verse 49, Jesus said, I am not demon. I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself. Now, that's interesting. I, I don't have an ego problem here, guys. I'm not trying to get famous. I'm not seeking glory for myself. But there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaimed, Now we know that you were demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. You see, for the Jewish men standing there that day, Abraham was better than Jesus. The prophets were better than Jesus, and they died. And here's Jesus saying, if you believe about me, what I say is true about me, if you, if you buy into me, then you'll never see death. They're like, man, you are crazy. And look at verse 
53. He says, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And that's a great, if you're in a Bible, you underline, if you have your phone to highlight, that's a great, that's a great question. Who do you think you are? And we get that question. Don't you ever been in an argument with somebody and you say that to them? Hey, 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 who do you think you are? You ever done that? Right? Hey, hey, you ever, anybody ever asked you that? Who do you, who do you, who do you think you are? All right? Where that's coming from is this place where you're acting like something that you're not. You're, you're putting on a certain way that's not who, that's, you're not this important. You're not this powerful. Who do you think you are? Jesus in a rare occurrence in the Bible, doesn't respond to their question with a question. Most of the time, when you ask Jesus a question, he annoys the mess out of you because he asks a question back. This is one of those rare occasions where he goes, oh, okay, I'll give you an answer. Who do you think you are? Verse 54, Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. This is beautiful because what he's saying is, Guys, I'm really important, but I don't go around telling people I'm really important. I let the Father bring glory to me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. This this is crazy language. Abraham, who's been dead for hundreds of years, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. And he saw it and was glad. Verse 57, (laughs) these guys are like, what in the world? You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Like Abraham's been dead for centuries, bro. Like, what are you talking about? You're, 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 You're not even 50 years old. And then verse 58. Jesus finally gets to the answer to their question about who do you think you are? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple court grounds. Here's the first question of today. Do you remember the first question? Did Jesus claim to be God? Did Jesus claim to be mighty God? Well, we'll jump into that answer, but let's talk first about the Jewish guys, how they responded to Jesus. Look back at verse 59 real quick. What did the guys, these Jewish guys, what were they going to do to Jesus? Stone him. They were going to stone him. Now, listen, I'm, I meant to go buy like a big rock, big stone and bring it, put it on stage. Like this wasn't like, this was like they would pick up stones like this big, it was brutal, brutal execution. Execution. And they would just throw rocks. So, I mean, that could take a little while. And they just, and so these guys pick up stones and they're going to throw rocks at him and, until he dies. What, what an amazing reaction to Jesus. They went from like having a heated conversation. This, this thing escalated quickly. Can we all agree? I mean, we, we were going back and forth having an argument, and now all of a sudden these guys are picking up stones and want to kill him. What was it? What triggered them? We like that word in our culture, right? What triggered them? What, what triggered these guys? What made them lose it? Why did they want to kill him? Well, they heard in Jesus' words blasphemy. Now, what blaspheming is just um, to claim to take on who God is, to be God. And they heard him blaspheme. And they knew the law. Leviticus chapter 24 tells very clearly to the Jewish people that they have a law, that anyone who blasphemes God, they are supposed to take up stones and kill them. And so these guys are good Jews. They're following their law. They're like, hey, this guy just said something. We're going to talk about what he said in a second. He just said something that calls him to say, no, we have to kill him. We have to. We legally have to kill him. And the only reason they didn't kill him is because he slipped away. So what, they were obeying a law that said we have to kill this guy. What did Jesus say to elicit such a response from them? Well, 
Verse 58, Jesus said this, very truly, I tell you, in other words, listen to me. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, for all of us sitting here as good non-Jewish people living in the 21st century, we're like, I, I don't get it, bro. Like, I don't, like, that, like, why is that what he said? Like, why is that such a big deal? I don't think, I don't think that's the thing. I don't know. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. <clears throat> the problem is, is we don't recognize what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is claiming the covenant name of God for himself by saying, before Abraham was born, I am. He's claiming the covenant name of God for himself. He's not simply saying, oh guys, I've always existed. Or he's not saying before Abraham was born, I was born. No, he's taking the name that the Hebrew scriptures gave, that God gave himself in the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus is taking the name that God revealed in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. God revealed his name in the Old Testament. Jesus is taking that name for himself. Now that's a moment. Now maybe you know the story if you've been around the Bible. You heard of the guy Moses? You guys, you know what I'm talking about? Moses went and freed the children, the, the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. Do you remember what happened? You know, he was out in the... Uh, shepherding and he was in his he was an old man he was basically being a shepherd an old man doing a, a teenager's job and he comes up on a bush one day that's on fire and burning but it's not being consumed by the fire and he has a conversation with God because God is revealing himself in the bush and talking to Moses and he's telling Moses I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go and Moses has excuses like hey I don't talk that great or what if you know I'm scared and, and eventually Moses says hey listen you know, there are many gods in Egypt. There's the sun god and the river god and the this god and that god and all these different gods. And he's wondering, well, who am I to tell? Who, when, I, when they ask me who sent me, what am I supposed to tell them? Like, who are you? Like, I don't even know who you are. Moses doesn't even know who he is. Who, who are you that I'm supposed to tell them that, that has, you know, you're like saying, hey, let the, Egypt, let the Israelites go out of Egypt. Like, who are you? And God through the bush, says this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So this is in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. These Jewish men would have had this memorized. This was a sacred Scripture. Jesus would have known it. Verse 14 said this, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so when Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am, that doesn't even make grammatical sense, does it? Before Jesus was born, I am. He's claiming this name that God gave himself in the Hebrew scriptures, that I am has sent you. Now, this word in the Hebrew is a word that we translate into English, Yahweh. Anyone ever heard the word Yahweh before? All right, so we use the name Yahweh. Uh, the name Yahweh is the name for God. Now, you do know that Jewish people will not speak or write the word Yahweh. They will not speak or write it. Do you ever heard the word Jehovah? All right, so Jehovah is an accident, by the way. It's an accident. In the Hebrew Scriptures, whenever scribes would be copying the, um, the, the, the manuscripts, and they were copying the manuscripts to make copies of them, they could not write Yahweh. It was against their faith to write the name Yahweh. And so in Hebrew, it's four consonants, and then you would write your vowels by putting little dots over the consonants, and this is how you create vowels. And so what they would do when they would get to the word Yahweh, instead of making it Yahweh, they would use the same consonants, but they would use different vowels, which created the word Jehovah. And so they use the word Jehovah as opposed to Yahweh because Yahweh is the name of God, and they will not utter the name of God. They will not write the name of God. That's true today, and that was true in Jesus' time. It was out of respect. So here's a group of people that will not even say or write the name of God talking to a man who is not yet 35, who says, hey, I know you won't say the name of God, but what I want you to know is not only I'm going to say it, I'm going to apply the name of God that you will not say or write, I'm going to apply the name of God to myself. Can you see the extreme moment that is for these guys? 
Now all of a sudden you understand, like, I, I might have picked up stones too. This, this, this Jesus is saying, right, point blank, I, that God, God took the name Yahweh, he gave the name Yahweh, and what Yahweh means is I am, meaning I've always existed, I'm pre-existent, I'm, I'm, I'm transcendent, I'm, I, I, I did, everything that is came from me, I'm, I'm sufficient, I'm not dependent upon anything. And Jesus is saying that, that which is true of God, that he's transcendent, that he's uncreated, that everything that's created is from him, that he has no beginning and it has no end. Everything that's true of Yahweh, everything that's true of him is also true of me. I am the same person. I am uncreated. Everything that is, is from me. I am fully God and fully man. I know there are many skeptics, even in this room or attending online or listening to this podcast in this moment. You sit on the fence of who you think Jesus is. Some of you are even like these Jews. You like Jesus. You would even say you believe in Jesus but you hold on to this idea that Jesus was like a model human. He was like a model character for us. That he always had a smile on his face and he was kind and gentle and he patted little kids on their heads and we all need to be more like Jesus. This is how you believe in him. But you overlook the fact that Jesus said things like this. That he didn't, that he said, that he claimed to be the I am. You overlook that. That he claimed to be the uncreated one. That these, these are his claims. You overlook that. Here's another thing you tend to overlook when you're thinking about Jesus. And if you just read the Gospels semi-closely, you'll see this. When Jesus is going through his everyday life, he says to people, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus takes everyone's sins as a personal sin against him in the Gospels. Everybody's sin is a sin against him. So he's always walking around telling people, hey, your sins are forgiven. Because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. Now, if you think Jesus is just a good teacher and a good person that we should listen to and we should be more like him, I'm going to tell you right now, you go to work Monday and you tell your coworkers that their sins are forgiven, it's going to be awkward. It's not a good way to live your life. And over and over and over again, we see Jesus doing that. And so you, when you say your sins are forgiven, you're assuming that all sin is against me. That's a claim of divinity. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says at one point, I sent you all prophets. I sent you all prophets. What? Dude, you're 30. You didn't send us prophets? What are you talking about? So those of you who are on the fence and you're like, I don't know, Jesus, maybe, maybe he wasn't, I'm not sure. At least what we have recorded of him is he claims. He claims clearly that he was God. Here's the thing. Jesus only gives you two options. He only gives all of us two options. Either the Jews are right, he was demon-possessed, and he was an imposter, which is what they said. He goes, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? So either they're right, he's demon-possessed and an imposter, that's one option, or the other option is this, Jesus is actually God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. That's it. Those are the two options. He's a demon, and he's an imposter, or he's God in flesh. Those are the only two options Jesus gives us. And here's the thing. Jesus would say, here are the two options for you, very simply. When it comes to Jesus, he would say this. Kill, kill me or crown me. Kill me or crown me. You got to decide. There's nothing in between. There's no middle ground. There's no like, I kind of like you. I'd like to hang out with you. I want some life advice. None of that. Kill me or crown me. That's it. Those are the only two options. So Jesus was asked the question in verse 53. Who do you think you are? And then Jesus answers the question by saying, before Abraham was, I am. He said, who do you think? You want to know who I think I am? I am the uncreated God. Jesus did claim to be the mighty God. He did. Okay, if he claimed to be the mighty God, what does he offer us? That's the second question. What does Jesus offer us by being the mighty God? Now, I didn't read this part of the conversation, but if you go back earlier in the conversation, these guys are going back and forth uh, with Jesus and these Jews. And at one point, Jesus says, hey, you guys, I can free you. I can make you free. And they're like, you can free us? Man, we've never been enslaved. Like, you can't free us. 
Now, maybe you're not a God, maybe you're not like a Bible scholar, but if I said, hey, have the Jews ever been enslaved in history? How might you answer that question? Yes, right? You don't even have to, like, you watch, watch movies and you know, like, yes, they've been enslaved prior to Jesus. Like, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, like, they were more enslaved than they ever were free. And so when they say, We've never been enslaved. We've always been free. They obviously know that Jesus is not talking about political freedom or liberty, that what Jesus is talking about is spiritual freedom. They understand the context. And so they're saying, hey, listen, Jesus, we don't need to be set free spiritually. We're good with God. We, we, we are of the right nation. We're of Abraham. We, we've always been free. We have spiritual freedom. And so Jesus says this in this conversation that's earlier. He says, here's the problem, guys. If you have sin in your life, you're not free. If there's sin, if if you've been stained with sin, if you have the the consequence of sin in your life is that you're not free, you're enslaved. You're in separation from God because of that sin. But then he says, if you trust me, if you trust who I am, then I can free you from that sin and I can make you free. This is where that famous passage is where it says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so this is what he's having this conversation with them. He's like, guys, guys, spiritually, you're not free. You're enslaved, but I can make you free. And he uses this great analogy. If you want to go read this later, it's verses 34 and 35. It's a quick little analogy. He uses this great analogy of a slave and a son. And he's saying, guys, a slave and a son both live in the house of the master, but one is free and the other is not. One has the rights of sonship, and the rights of ownership, and the rights of inheritance, and one is not even a permanent resident. They can be sent out at any moment. The contrast between the slave and the son could not be any more strong. They are not the same people. They do not have the same experience, but they both live in the same house. They both live in the same house. One is free and one is not. And what Jesus says to these Jews is, What you guys don't know is I'm the son and you're the slave. I'm a permanent resident in the house. I have all the rights of sonship. I have all the rights of of a legal belonging to the father and being, being able to stay in his house. But then he says to them, you guys are the slave and I can change you from being a slave to a son. I can change your relationship with God. I can move you from having no rights or permanent place in the master's house to one who has instant intimacy with the master and one who has a permanent who is a permanent resident in the in the master's house here's the point Jesus is saying I'm without sin so I have the legal right to remain in the house you guys are not without sin so you are, don't have the legal right to stay in the house but here's the thing I can get rid of your sin I can make you pure. I can make you holy. I can solve the problem of your sinfulness so that you can be legally adopted into the master's house. And this is the truth with what Jesus does for us. He's mighty God, and this is what he does for you, okay? Very clearly, Jesus takes us who are sinners, who have no right, we have no claim to be a permanent resident in the master's house. Because God is perfect and holy, and we're not. And Jesus says, I will forgive you of your sin so that you can become the sons and daughters of God and be legally protected as a permanent resident, as a child of God. And what Jesus is claiming in this analogy is that he is the pathway to legally become God's child. So the first thing this mighty God Jesus does for us is he moves you from being a slave to a son or a daughter. That's the first thing he does. And he does that by bringing us forgiveness of our sins so that the father does not have to be our judge. He can be our father. That's the power of forgiveness. And only God can do this. Only God can forgive your sins. Because all of our sins are actually not against someone else. Our sins are against him. And Jesus says he's the one who does it. He's the forgiver of our sins. That's the first thing that this mighty God does for us. The second thing that this mighty God does for us 
is that he offers us a promise that we will never see death. He says, whoever obeys my word, which just means whoever believes I am who I say I am, whoever buys into this truth, if you trust that truth, you will never see death. You will never see death. I think it's interesting in this text that Jesus uses that idea of seeing. You will never see death, that verb. You will never see death. If you've ever been with anyone who's passed away, if you've ever been in the room when they pass, there is a moment where you just sense they left. Like you, If you've ever been in the room with someone who's passed on and you see their body left behind, you know without any doubt that they're not there, that they're gone. I mean, like you're looking at their body. Like it, everything about them is still that you remember is still there. Like the features are all still there. The, 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 they have this, everything's the same. Nothing's changed, but you know, like, oh, they're gone. They're gone. And what Jesus is saying is that death, when it comes for us, those of us who trusted Christ won't see it coming. We won't see it when it showed up. And death always wins. You know that, right? I mean, this funeral that I'm preaching today at 2 o'clock, this 15-year-old girl was diagnosed with a genetic disorder at 2 years old. And they knew from that moment that she would eventually die. They just didn't know how long they would get with her. And guess what? She did. She did die. Only God can defeat death. You and I might defeat illness or financial ruin or hardship, but none of us can cheat death. Not a single one of us. Everyone dies. So what is Jesus promising? He says you will never see death, and yet we see death all the time. So what is he actually promising? Well, let me say this very clearly. You are more than the sum of your body parts. There's something to you It's more than your body. That's why you can be in a room where someone has passed away and their body is left behind, but you know that they're not there because you are more than the sum of your body parts. And this is always a weird thing I say to people, but I chat with them about this. I'll say, if I cut your body open, would I find you? Weird, right? It's a weird thing to say to someone, but it makes them think. You can't find you. You are something beyond your body parts. And what Jesus is saying is that part of you that's more than your body parts, that part of you is your spirit. And that part of you is the part that lives on and that will never see death. That's the part of you, the real part of you that will not die. That real part of you just simply leaves. Your body will die, but your spirit will not. Jesus says he has overcome death on our behalf. And that's only something God can do. That's only something God can do. You and I can't defeat death. We cannot win against it. We can do all kind of things. We can beat all kind of things, but we cannot defeat death. And Jesus says, yep, I know you can't defeat death. I'm the one who can defeat death. And he's done it. Jesus defeated death for each of us by being crucified on the cross for all of our sins and then three days later, later resurrecting from the dead so that we will never see death. So at Christmas time, this is what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating goodwill towards men or peace on earth. We're not. Those things are not here yet. They're just not here yet. But what we are celebrating at Christmas time is the mighty God. The mighty God that came to earth to change us from slaves to his children. And then the mighty God who came to earth to guarantee that his children, that he loves, would never see death. And that their spirits would simply leave this world into his glory. Now, as we leave today, I want to read a quote by C.S. Lewis. Because I want to read this for those of you who are still skeptical. This will take two more minutes. For those of you who are still skeptical, you're like, well, I mean, you know, they probably added this stuff into the Bible. You know, the Gospels were probably changed later and made Jesus look divine. Here's the problem with that. If you go through the Gospels and you read them, all four of them, and you try to, if you just remove everywhere that 
it's like an insinuation that Jesus is God, you will have very little left <laughs> because it's all over the Gospels. It's all over the Gospels. It also doesn't make sense to make a poor Jewish... It would have made sense to make a Roman emperor God. They did that a lot because he was famous and popular and everybody knew who he was. Please explain to me the logic to taking some, what I call a souped up redneck from Galilee. Guys, I tell you this all the time. Rome didn't even want Galilee. Like they dominated lands, they dominated Galilee, and they went, ooh, we don't want this. Y'all can have it. They didn't even want it. And this is where Jesus is from. Like what sense does it make to take some poor redneck carpenter and then turn him into God? Like it just... It's the craziest perspective. But I know you're skeptical. I know you're like, ah, just need Jesus. This is the problem with Christians. They want to make Jesus God. And I'm not sure. He would probably be embarrassed that you guys had made him God. The Gospels are the most reliable ancient documents that exist. And if you remove Jesus' claims to be divine from them, they are nothing left, hardly. So I want to read you this quote for those of you who are skeptical. You kind of want Jesus to be a good teacher or a good like model or a good example, but you don't really want to buy into this God thing. Listen to what Lewis said. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I, don't, I do not accept his claim to be God. That is one of the things we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, which I don't even know what a poached egg is. Someone have to tell me later, that's fine but I'm guessing it means you're a lunatic if you claim to be a poached egg, on the level of someone who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. He is either God, or he is a liar, or a lunatic. You can either crown him, or kill him. But those are your only two options. Will you stand with me as I pray? Father, thank you for Christmas that you sent your son Jesus, your very self. Thank you that he is indeed the mighty God and that he did for us what only, what only God can do for us. He changed our relational status with you from slave to child. And he removed the curse of death from us so that all of us, all of us in Christ we actually not see, will not see death. Our bodies will die, but the part of us, our spirits, will never even see it. And so then I ask, well, what will we see? Well, I think of your words, Jesus, Father. I think your, the words of Jesus, Father, where he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back and I will get you. Well, I guess that tells us who we'll see when it's time for us to leave this world. We won't see death we'll see Jesus, our mighty God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, friends. Have a blessed week and a wonderful day. We love you.